What a thrill it is to be here to finally see this work that, in truth, um, I've written about to some extent before having seen it built. It is way more spectacular in real life than it could possibly be in anyone's um, preliminary imagination of it. You've all walked past it coming in, so I'm not going to I'm not going to have to sell you on um, what are dramatic, graceful. Um, just um, really quite exhilarating piece it is. Um, I also um, really don't need to be on this, on the, at the head of this room at all. Nancy Rubens, um, I know from experience, is um, perfectly capable of telling the story of her remarkable no, career <laughs> herself. Um, uh, Nancy, as it happens, was born in, in Texas, Naples, Texas. She was raised in Tullahoma, Tennessee. I've said that a few times today. I'm not sure I'm saying it right. Um, was educated at the Maryland Institute College of Art and um, then at UC Davis in the ceramics program there, um, which um, was a really uh, important place for the exploration of groundbreaking ideas in sculpture then and actually now as well. Um, and uh, I, we're going to run through some images in a pretty straightforward chronological fashion, um, starting with uh, work from, from the late 70s. Um, these are experiments with plaster, and we're about exploring ideas of stability. So I'm going to turn this over to you. OK, thanks. Um, these are pieces that I first made when I first got out of graduate school. Uh, I went to UC Davis for graduate school. Um, I, I studied with uh, uh, many people there. One of them was the ceramicist Bob Arneson, and also Bill Wiley was there at the time, uh, Roy DeForest, um, uh, uh, Wayne Thiebaud, some good people. And it was a small program, and um, I graduated, and moved to San Francisco and got a waitress job and got a night, was teaching day, night, day school at night at the Art Institute. And um, I was working all the time. And uh, at that time, I would go to the Goodwill and the Salvation Army with friends of mine. It's going on its own. Um, um, and my friends liked to look at vintage clothes. And I was not so interested in the vintage clothes. However, um, there, uh, and it was about economy at that time for me, but several things, economy was one of them. But there in the corner at the Goodwill and the Salvation Armies were all these television sets, big plastic console TVs that were 25 cents each, 50 cents each. And I thought, whoa. I remember when my family got a TV. We got one TV, and we had it forever, and that was it. And here are all these TVs, 25 cents, 50 cents. So I started buying them, hoarding them, really. I bought 289 television sets. <laughs> and my plan was when I would build it, my, I had a roof in my lease. It was a, 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 a um, you know, cast concrete building. And the roof was in the lease, and my plan was to build a sculpture that silhouetted uh, the city of San Francisco with the television sets. And you stood at Point X, and you'd see, you wouldn't see the city, you'd see my television sets. And I was going to paint them fluorescent orange and pack them with concrete. And my landlord got wind of it, and he said, forget about it. You're not going to do this. They're going to fall off the roof. You're going to kill somebody. And I said, OK. So I didn't do that piece, but I built a smaller version of it inside my studio, which I painted fluorescent orange. I turned the TVs upside down, right side out, packed them with concrete. The sculpture never worked. It was a, a clodhopper. It, the televisions never transcended the televisionness of them, even though I turned them upside down and painted them orange. The concrete was still concrete in the seams. It wasn't good. And it, it, it also had, uh, it was very Louise Nevelson-like in the structure. And that wasn't the direction I wanted to go. So one evening, I'm up late with my neighbors, and we're talking, and we're having a beer, and it's about 1 in the morning. And I grew up in the east, and I'd never seen an earthquake before. But suddenly, like the projectors in the ceiling, I had a lamp like that, and it started swinging. 
And then all of a sudden, my big concrete wall just made this wave. I just saw a whoop, this wave go through it. And I was stunned that this material that I considered so hard and so static and so big and hard and concrete, in the right condition, became this fluid thing. And I was really impressed by that. So I thought, leave those stupid television sets alone and start thinking about this concrete, because it really could give me something. So I started putting up a plywood wall, a ply sheet of plywood, and then I would attach to the plywood several sheets of plywood, um, the stuff they make feral cement boats out of, very thin rebar, maybe 3 8 of an inch rebar, and expanded metal. And I would trowel up to the side of the expanded metal with my hand with a glove um, the concrete, which you see here. So what I loved about the concrete was that I could sh schlep it up this expanded metal. I could trowel it up with my hands, and it would set up. And all the little bits and pieces, as I'm troweling it up, would slop to the bottom and become this wonderful anchor at the bottom of the structure. And then once it dried, I could pop the plywood, can we get to the next one, off the walls of it. And one side, you'd see where the plywood was. And on the other side, you'd see where the hand marks were, where the little dribbles of crud of the concrete would slop down. And it was kind of a, a freezing of a moment that all these things that happened were impressed into that concrete. Also, I want to say something. In my cast concrete building, I built a sleeping loft. And um, above my head where I slept, when the guy, the construction workers, poured the concrete building, somebody must have had a pork chop that day and smoked a cigar because there was an impression of a pork chop bone. And the pork chop bone had released from the mold. And the cigar stub was still in the concrete. And I would go to sleep at night looking at that in the concrete. And I think that affected my brain. <laughs> so what I loved about these pieces is that after they were built, I could push them, and they would waver from side to side. Nothing broke, nothing cracked. It was just this beautiful flexibility of the concrete. And I love that about them. Now, those pieces kind of evolved from working with clay for many years. I was never a real ceramicist, because ceramics are fi fired clay. I never fired anything. I was a, a fake ceramicist. I would work with the clay, make things, take pictures of them, and throw them back into the slip bucket, the slop bucket, and so it would melt back into the clay. And my reasoning for that was because at that time I took my first anthropology class, and I learned in that class that little shards of ceramics, even if they were small and broken, last a really, really long time. And this is in 1970 when I first started working with the clay. And at that time, every hippie and his mother were making really, really bad ceramics. And the world was being littered with all these very bad ceramics. And I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to use the clay as a tool to help me figure something out. And what that was was the physics of how things stood up and fell down. And I had a friend, uh, Sydney Reichman, she was a fabulous potter. This is my first two years of school when I was in Nashville at Peabody College, uh, before I transferred to Baltimore to art school. And this friend of mine would throw these most gorgeous, big, giant pots, and she was a really talented potter. And I would sit by her at the potter's wheel, and she, you know, took me on with humor. And I would make my pot, build, you know, throw this pot and make, watch it go up, and then find the point that it wasn't going to go up anymore, and I couldn't keep it there. And it would go, and I'd watch it go down. And I really learned a lot about a certain sense of physics. I have no other way of saying that through watching what made this clay stand, the wet clay, and what pushed it too far, and went, it went down. And so these pieces are kind of an evolution of that in a funny way. We're going to trade, um, and I'm going to run past a couple of slides um, because Nancy has already 
spoken about the um, introduction of, of appliances into the work, which happened um, pretty early on, yeah. by, the, by the early 80s. Yeah. Um, there were already these uh, major home appliances, everything from fans and toasters to um, anything, anything. televisions were definitely yeah. part of it. Um, and you've already heard, I think, a premonition of um, the concerns with the fluidity of materials, with um, questions of um, precarious balance, and with being, you'll all be relieved to know, extremely um, calculating and careful um, in developing uh, the, the physics of these soon, um, they soon to become very, very big sculptures indeed. Um, by the mid 80s, there were late 80s, there were airplane parts. Early 80s. Um, uh, uh, late 80s, yeah. And I want to get to um, these sculptures of the, of the early 90s when um, sculptural objects as big as entire trailer homes um, began to be involved in the work. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about the, um, just the importance of scale and of really bringing things up to the size of um, residences rather than just objects that would go inside them. Um, thank you. Um, the electric appliances, the small ones, I used for many years, and I loved it. And, I, and my my way of working is I push the material as far as I can and um, get as much out of it as I can. And uh, a change happened in my life. In 82, I went to the West Coast. I went to LA. I was offered a teaching job at UCLA. I didn't want the teaching job. I was trying to get my career going to New York. But I was broke. I had no money at the time. I had been getting commissions and public projects and grants and such forth. But income, forget about it. And I had been uh, uh, juggling between getting grants, doing commissions, getting projects, waitressing, house painting. I can plaster a wall. I had a company called the Mudders of Invention, me and my girlfriends <laughs> with mud walls. You know, there were a lot of things that were being juggled at that time. And I was offered the teaching job, and a friend of mine said, oh, go for a year, save the money like you, because I had been taking teaching jobs in various places, in Florida and Richmond, you know, for a semester here and there when someone was on a sabbatical leave. And so I went to LA, and I had kind of used the appliances a lot, and I was kind of done with them. And I'm in LA, and I'm looking around, and there's mobile homes. I thought, oh, it's a swollen appliance. <laughs> so I started thinking about them. And the first piece I did with mobile homes was for a, 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 a public piece in San Francisco for a show uh, that Lang New Langton Arts did. It was across the street from City Hall. And I got six mobile homes. And I thought, well, get saws and cut them up, and I'll use the elements and make this thing. And we got saws and cut up the mobile homes. And I wanted to take chunks of the mobile home, like a corner. But the thing about mobile homes is they're built like a house of cards. It's uh, you know walls, basically, and a steel floor that keeps them all together, and then some stuff that's stapled around the edge that keeps the walls together. When you start cutting them up, you don't get chunks. You get flat things. And so I made a sculpture with these flat things, and I was really unhappy with it. It wasn't what I wanted at all. So I was invited to Pittsburgh to do this, this piece. Uh, this is called Another Kind of Growth, and it's built between the negative space of these three trees. And uh, it was uh, a, a, an organization, and they got a university involved, and some students were working with me. And they said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, I want some appliances, some kind of large appliances. I'd like some mobile homes. <laughs> and they found me these mobile homes. And uh, we worked with, I don't think we worked with an engineer. We just designed this bridge-like structure out of steel. And we weren't able to go into the ground of the park. You can see these concrete blocks that were uh, 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 
holding the steel up. And so that's when I started uh, using those mobile homes. Um, soon thereafter, I started going up to the town of Mojave. My husband was really interested in uh, Rutan, that guy who makes those exotic planes. Mm -hmm. And he, he, that was his interest. And so I would be a girlfriend and go with my cute new boyfriend to this place. And, and I'd, all of a sudden, there were fields of these airplane parts that were dismantled. They were refuse airplane parts. And I thought, oh my god, look at those things. Look at the rivets and the metal and the shapes. And these things were exquisite. And I thought, who could make that? I can't make those things. So I tried to get people to sell them to me. And it took three or four years to finally get someone willing to sell them to me. Because people would say, oh, lady, that's the Air Forces. You can have that in three years, but we're keeping it up for scrap. And I would always get stories. So finally, someone directed me to Mr. Huffman. And Mr. Huffman was this lovely gentleman who had, should I keep going on with this? OK. Uh, is, is this lovely gentleman who had 17 acres of mountains of these things. And uh, he had a big smelter. And he collected them and collected them. And he took a liking to me. And he would sell them to me at that time for scrap value, which was 10 cents a pound at that time. And I would fill a truck. And what a great material. It was much cheaper than Windsor Newton paint or bronze. And it was much better. And so I kind of got really excited by that. And Mr. Huffman became my friend. And then, therefore, over the years, as I knew Mr. Huffman, one time I went to visit him, and his, his pile shrunk. It was still a, a hill. It wasn't the giant mountains. He still had plenty. I said, Mr. Huffman, what happened to all your stuff? Where, well, the price of aluminum went up. The Japanese wanted X amount of tonnage. He's, cranked up the smelter, made the ingots, and sent it out. And also, Mr. Huffman um, had a picture of himself in the National Geographic that he was very proud of from the late 40s. And he had designed a mobile smelter, and he went around the, the West Coast, uh, the West, the Midwest, and melted down the fleet from World War II. And so... <laughs> And so I'd like to take a little digression um, to talk about the work on paper that Nancy started doing in the early 1990s, work made with um, very heavily inscribed graphite um, directly on paper that is uh, arranged in fairly extemporaneous ways in, um, in gallery situations. In, in a certain sense, they are specific to the rooms in which they're hung. And I don't know whether um, when you're looking at these drawings, you're thinking about monochrome for Austin, but it was my idea, probably not mine alone, that there is a particularly strong relationship between the monochrome sculptures that Nancy has been making um, in recent years and these drawings that have been ongoing since the early 90s. So I wonder if you'd talk about um, both the drawings and that, um, that relationship of um, the kind of improvisational way that you work? Um, I, these drawings are from the 90s. And I first started drawing with this very dense graphite when I was a, a graduate student at Davis. And I wasn't really sure what I was doing. But I was really questioning what a drawing is and what's a sculpture and what art is, and how do you make this thing, or is it a thing? So when I was a graduate student, um, I ha I've always had a little excess energy. And um, I would draw on everything I had. My studio was a mess. I piled with a lot of stuff. And I started just drawing on everything on my floor. And then um, a guy who was an art conservator came over to me, and, and he gave me a lecture about real materials, or honorable materials. That's what he's, uh, honorable materials. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then one day he brings to me a roll of the most beautiful paper, this beautiful roll of rag paper, just beautiful paper. And he said, here, take it. And so I thought, mm, nice. So I'd roll the paper on the floor, and I started penciling on this paper. 
But then once I pencil on the paper, I didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't a puddle on the floor. It wasn't a painting on the, I wasn't sure what to do with these things. So one of them I put over for a, like a graduate review. You have to present to the faculty what you've been doing. I, it was hard for me to figure out how to get the work I was doing out of the studio to present. So, because it seemed like a very active thing rather than a, a, an object. So I got a rope and put a rope in a one piece of paper, like it was a 17-foot piece of paper over like a tent. And then I built a giant sawhorse and put one drawing. And I wasn't, so as time went by, I, I, I thought of them, they were drawings. And so then when I moved to New York, I started making drawings of the placement of sculpture and I let go of those drawings. I let go of drawing in that way. And I wasn't really, the drawings were just kind of a sideline of some, I was doing sculpture and the drawings were the sideline and the drawings were of the placement of the sculpture. I would draw spaces and stuff like that and where the point X, where the sculpture should be and where it would go. And, and um, then I, when I moved to LA, my friend uh, who took my space in New York, who was living in it, said, you know, there's a, there's a closet here full of all these drawings. What do you want me to do with them? I said, you know, send them over to me. So she sent them out to me, <laughs> and I looked at them, and I thought, these are terrible drawings. I don't, what was I, what was I thinking? And I thought, well, we can always make old bad drawings, new good drawings. So I just put them on the floor and started using that old paper that had drawings under them, and it was good paper, and just redrawing them. So that's how these pieces started evolving from those old drawings. Here's a, a close-up that I think is a pretty vivid illustration of just how heavily worked the paper is um, and how metallic it is when the graphite gets that thick. Um, it, that it has that kind of mineral glint that, um, that the aluminum does in some ways. There, there were a couple of, of sculptures um, at around this time, the early 90s, where the appliances, in this case hot water heaters, were combined directly with um, works on paper. Um, it became, the paper became a, a sculptural material. Here we are at um, one of the most massive uh, sculptures probably ever built for indoor installation. This was, um, this was a piece that was made for the Helter Skelter exhibition, at a sort of landmark show in Los Angeles. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit both about, you sort of referred to um, the importance of moving to Los Angeles, but um, being part of the Los Angeles art community rather than the one in New York and um, how that shaped what you did. Well, the Los Angeles art community, Los Angeles is huge. People are far away from each other. There, it's, a, it's a very spread out place. So, you don't see your community hardly ever. Uh, you talk on the phone. At that time, I had a teaching job at UCLA, so that was a place that I would see people. And so uh, there were other artists who were teaching there at the time, but w uh, that were uh, are important artists uh, that you're conscious of today. Um, but I think the biggest change for me in going to LA was that there was space and there was time. I had space to build these huge pieces, but I also had space to store the stuff. And there was also space for the people who gave it to you to store it. So space was a really, really important thing in LA for me. Um, and the art community was kind of un, unformed at that time the art community we think of as the LA art scene. It was really very raw and uh, really quite unformed. I think that this exhibition actually uh, pivoted a lot of people's careers and became the LA art scene. Um, but I, I think the move to LA was really about space for me and, and time and privacy um, because you don't see people in LA, so you have this lovely time and privacy to do the work 
you know, you're not always going to the corner to meeting your pal and having coffee. It's, it, it's a very quiet, you have quite a lot of quiet time there, which I, I really love. I'm, I'm glad to hear you talk about quiet because the work um, doesn't, although I think in, it, in some respect the work involving canoes does have a sense of silence and solitude, but also there's so much energy generated by your work that, that, that silence isn't the first thing <laughs> you would um, associate with it. But um, certainly space, you know, the, the expansiveness of um, the, the Western sense of landscape as opposed to the sense of space in the East and some of the artists that you worked with um, at UCLA. I know you've talked about Simon Rohde and the Watts Tower, some other aspects of the LA um, art world um, in its broadest sense that have come into the work. Um, another image. Um, I'm going to pause here for a, a minute. Um, th this is from a series of works that were made with mattresses and cakes. And at this moment, um, it came up briefly in the introduction, um, the question of whether or not there is a gender politics to the work, I think, is often raised. Um, the sort of combination of mattress eroticism, cake appetite, um, women's approach to monumental sculpture. Um, I, 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 I'm. I'm well aware of that point of view, but I want to tell you how I got to this work. Um, I first started using the mattresses when I was invited to Baltimore to my old art school to do a show, to be in a group show. And I'm on the plane going there, and, they, and I'm supposed to tell them when I get there what materials I want to work with. And I'm, I don't know yet, and I'm on the plane, and I'm kind of taking a nap, but really daydreaming. And, and I'm kind of going through alleys in my mind in Baltimore, and I see mattresses all over these alleys, and I think, that's it. Mattresses are everywhere. I'll get mattresses. And I get there, and somebody there says, you know, we have this thing that we use to put around, they put around bales of hay and stuff like that and keep wood together, and it was a crimper. You crimp these straps. And so we started rolling these mattresses into these tight forms, and squeezing these bands around them, and I built that piece. And uh, I built a series of pieces with mattresses, and I was invited to be in a group exhibition in Vienna, Austria, uh, because, uh, because of this Helter Skelter exhibition, this group of Los Angeles artists suddenly became hot, and we were invited all over to do things, in Europe especially. The Europeans loved these artists at that time. So um, a gallerist in Vienna in, invited a group there, and she asked me what I wanted to work with. And I thought, gosh, what is in Vienna that I can't get any other place? Cake. They have <laughs> fabulous cake in Vienna. And so I tell the gallerist, I'd like cake. And she said, cake. I said, yes, don't you have wonderful cakes, soccer torts? And, she said, no, I can't get you cake. I said, no? No. I said, uh, why not? I thought it was economy. I thought she didn't want to buy it. No, she said, uh, it's, we don't have any. The war in Yugoslavia was going on. The war in Yugoslavia was going on at the time. And she said, we don't have any. More, there's, there's a shortage of cake. I thought, that's very odd. <laughs> and uh, she's, and I get there, and there's cake everywhere. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what is that about? And I realized there was a, a so then, um, so I offered her another uh, work, a drawing. I installed a drawing instead. So um, soon thereafter, I'm invited to a place in northern Germany, Lingen, Germany, at a Kunsthall there to install a piece. And actually, this is the piece I built in, in the Kunsthall in Lingen, Germany. But I get the, to Germany. It's a long flight from LA, and nobody's flying your business class at that time. It's economy, and it's t you're tired, and it's a, it's a long flight from LA to Germany. And I get there, and the director of the Kunsthall brings me into his office. And he has a big sigh, and he says, 
Miss Rubens, yes, hair sheepers, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He has a big sigh. Ah, oh, it's the cake. I said, what, what's the problem? He said, we can't get them for you. I said, no. He said, no. I said, what, what is the, why is this a problem? And then he said, uh, it's the children. The children? And then he said, um, it's, the, it's the war. And I thought, the war? And I'm thinking, what war is he referring to? <laughs> and I realized it was all the wars. It was World War, it was every war that was ever in Europe. And it was the war that was going on then. And I thought, what a weird thing. And it was the shame of having cakes and sugar and flour and butter when the war in former Yugoslavia was going on. And it was considered vulgar to display these beautiful cakes when there was a war going on. I thought, whoa, these cakes, this is serious. And I said, so, hair sheepers, I didn't realize you had this problem with my work. And, you know, I didn't realize you had this problem with my work. I shouldn't be here. I should go home. He said, no, 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 don't go home. I said, but you have this, it's not your work, it's the cakes. I said, the cakes are my work. And so he said, okay, you'll get cakes, but they won't be nice ones. I said, you, listen, in, in America, I was using five-day-old Entenmann's. You know, get, don't you have stale cake? No, there's no stale cake. Okay, so we build the whole piece with mattresses, and then uh, I keep saying, so where's the cakes? He said, they'll be here tomorrow. So I get to the Kunsthalle, and there in, in the gallery is a stack of styrofoam that you could build a house out of. It was huge. And, and he said, they won't be very nice. They'll be frozen cakes. I said, that's great, because frozen, it'll be easier to manipulate. I can put them on frozen, and then they'll thaw in place, and they'll settle in. That's perfect for me. And uh, he brought the most beautiful cakes I'd ever seen in my life. They were big round cakes with frosting and strawberries and raspberries and shades of chocolate. And they were gorgeous cakes, cakes and round bunt cakes and chocolate log cakes. And they were just beautiful cakes. And I thought, this is too weird, these cakes. So I made the piece. And then I was invited to the Venice Biennale <clears throat> to be in the Aperito. Uh, to be in, a, in next, the Aperito. And this is the Corderia where they make the rope for the, it's a mile long building. This is at the end of it. And Herr Sheepers was very sweet because when he shipped the mattresses, all the soft cakes they threw away, but all of the chocolate bricks and the little round bunt cakes, it's sugar and they were preserved and they lasted forever. So he was able to ship those for me. So in my thinking, these cakes were more about a certain fragility of civilization, really, that, you know, when things aren't so good, you don't have cake. When things are nice, you have a cake. And the cake falls apart sometimes and gets mushy and does these things. And I, I realize that, you know, people have lots of different associations, but that's the, the journey that I took that brought me to using these cakes. So much for the gender politics of... <laughs> Cake, cake, cakes and mattresses. Um, thank you for that. So what I'd love to do is get to um, a discussion of, uh, although it, it pains me to go past these spectacular um, sculptures, a lot of these use airplane parts. And the airplane parts actually do have a relationship to um, the monochromes that followed Um, these works, which were the first works that um, involved boats rather than um, things that, that go in water rather than things that go in air or live on ground. And I'm going to pause here um, at a, a, a quite spectacular sculpture made of um, things that go in the water um, that was installed at Lincoln Center. I'll back up to that great image. Um, so. 
tell us about how these materials came into the work and particularly um, how things got so colorful. Very often when critics write about um, this work, they talk about bouquets of flowers. Um, I've seen that more than once. And it is, in fact, an irresistible association. So how did, how did the color come into it? I first started collecting these boats. Well, my husband had a Grumman canoe. And I was looking at it, and I said, God, it's amazing. This canoe, it, it really reminds me of the airplane parts. And he said, Goofus, it's made by Grumman. And I thought, oh, that's right. That makes perfect sense. And so after the war, and the company's still making warplanes, but they started making these lovely canoes. And I started thinking about that, and I thought, God, those things are just beautiful. And uh, I started collecting them and built the piece at the museum in, in La Jolla, the San Diego Museum, the cantilevers off the roof. And I was invited to build this piece for Lincoln Center. And I started seeing these kayaks, these plastic kayaks. And they're really cheap. I could get them for not much. And they're really great looking. So I started weaving them into uh, the aluminum boats for this particular piece. And uh, that's where the color came from. It just what was on the boats. The, big, the pleasure point boats were painted blue. There were a lot of aluminum fiberglass, but then the plastic kayaks really kind of kicked it in. There's a red motorboat in there. There's a lot of, but the color just became, it was really fun to work with all that color. But then, I was asked to do a piece for Las Vegas for uh, a huge uh, uh, piece of property that MGM was developing. And uh, it's a fabulous piece. It's like a 95-foot cantilever, cantilevering over this road. And the thing that uh, MGM was really attracted to was all this garish color that I was mucking around with. And I built this piece for them, and it's a great piece. And thank God I had Jaime Garza, my wonderful engineer, to work with me, because I would have. <laughs> university of Texas. Jaime's a graduate from this university. And he works with me from LA now. Um, and I kind of got overwrought with all that color in doing that piece. And also in doing that piece in Las Vegas, I had these used uh, aluminum canoes. And when we were walking back and forth to the site and the weather was changing and sometimes it would rain, those aluminum canoes that were used had such, uh, 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 had such depth of character, for lack of a better word. Every time I looked at them, they were different. They changed in the light and the moisture. Sometimes they looked like granite. Sometimes they, they were just beautiful. You'd see the seams in them and the welds and the holes and all the use and the reuse and the reuse and, I, and, and the marks in them. And I admit that made me think about the drawings. Um, so when I finished that piece, I didn't want to touch color for a long time. And so I started collecting these aluminum canoes with no paint and started working with them. And one thing that I should have said earlier when Nancy was asking me to relate the drawings to the sculpture is this. Sometimes I'll see a shadow on my sculpture pad or on a sidewalk of a sculpture I'm doing. And I think I'm seeing one of my drawings. Not the surface of it, but the form. And it, it surprises me, because I, I, I don't really think of that overlay, you know, consciously. And so, yeah. Uh. So would, I, I've just gotten a signal that we're almost out of time. And I did want to, I, I wanted to have um, a chance for you to talk about the development of these particular pieces, the, the ones that are represented here um, in Texas. These are slides of um, monochromes in, at the Albright Knox and here in um, Paris. So just a few words about these monochromes. Um, 
Uh, this is a series of the monochromes which we have here in Austin. And I, I just loved working with these pieces. I don't really know what else to say. I, I just. <laughs> Sure. There is a lot of planning that goes into these things. And sometimes it takes the piece that I did here with, in Austin and Andre invited me to do. We, since the day she invited me, it's been less than a year. That is very, very fast to uh, be invited and then to realize a piece. Sometimes these things can take years and years and years. And my fabulous engineer is really conscious that I need to be able to improvise when I'm on site. So he's helped me to design structures that can withstand anything. Anything, really. Earthquake, wind, storm, everything. But they also allow me a certain flexibility. So if when we're on site, we need a cantilever to go this way or that way, we have these things called the T's. And th those things tie on to the superstructure, bolt onto the superstructure, and so we can develop a little cantilever here if we want, or a little cantilever there. So when I come onto the site first and see it, and it, before the, the piece is built and we're planning it, I, I have an idea of I want it to cantilever over the road this way and the door is here and the sidewalk is there and I want it to cantilever over the sidewalk this way and so when you approach it that way and, so, and how it works with the building, all those things I can figure out prior to being here. However, when you're on site, where you stick a particular boat or where certain little fluffy bits of the cantilever go, you can, I can't tell in time on site. We literally are creating the work when we're there. There's a model, but does it follow the model? Not really. So it's really about being on site and having the flexibility on site to make a decision and having a fabulous crew work with me who I have almost an unspoken language with at this point. My chief installer, Colin Cook, I've been working with since 1992. And these folks come from all over the place. Colin's living in Paris now. Uh, uh, Bill is in Portland, Christian is in New York, two of the fellas come from LA. So we come from all over the place to get together to build these things. And these guys are super patient with me because I'll say, I want it to go that way. No, turn it this way. No, put it that way a little bit. And we just kind of talk it through and the cables go in and, uh, you know, and Someone asked me in a student group today, do you ever undo anything? Never. <laughs> and the, the, the proof of the, of the just perfection of that um, final decision is just outside the door. So do we have time for some questions? That the siding for the sculpture is, it, it, I, I know in advance, because those are big decisions. Uh, you know, the foundation goes down 33 feet, and nine feet of that is into bedrock, okay, I think, okay? Um, but the boats, those are instantaneous decisions that are made like this. It's a, every, every single boat yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know if it's always been part of my language, but it's a big part of it. And I have no explanation for it. <laughs> yes, sir. When did you think, uh, when did you realize you had to start working with an engineer? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, really, when things started going in the public realm. You know, I, there's this thing that in my family we call seat of the pa your pants engineering. You know, it, and it's from learning from the clay. What makes it stand up? What makes it go down? So a lot of this stuff for many years I built without engineers because I knew through just gradual experience if I did this and this and this, it would work, you know. But once you get in, in, a, in a public realm, 
you have to be really responsible and careful that way. And then you bring in uh, the engineer to make sure that your steel is good, that the welds are good, that the design is good, and the seat of the pants doesn't fly anymore, you know? Thanks, you guys. Thank you.